I'm Commander Shepard, and BGS is my favorite show on the Citadel. This is Three Dog! How can I help? It is now the very first time in the existence of this galaxy that we the people have been in single digit days away from Mass Effect Andromeda. This is Video Game Sophistry, your weekly check on the world of video games. We talk about the high art, we talk about the business. This week I am joined by a different casting crew. It's changing up each week, but you know I'm going to be here. We have Liam Brand pressing some buttons, Richard Jellison, I guess speaking, being alive, and uh, a new intern. His name's Jesse. You might remember him from before. He is uh, walking around here, so you might see him. Head to, of course, our YouTube video game sophistry to see this entire video, see the extended interviews, and everything great. Um, guys. Yeah. Yes. There we go. How much would you say I am a fan, start with you, Liam, of Mass Effect? So much so that uh, they know you at BioWare. They have your picture up on the wall okay. and a big darts thrown at it. Okay. Is it like a, with a heart around it or do you think it's just like a picture and like they drew a Hitler mustache? You know that picture of Liara in Shepard's room? Yes. Or uh, not to really Liara, Tali? It's that, but you- Just ruined it. Damn it, Richard. I gave you one chance to speak. Oh. Anyways, we are nine down. I'm kidding. We're nine days away from Mass Effect Andromeda, and we always talk about it. Every week, we have a segment where we talk about it in some way. This week, we will have segments where we discuss that. The trophy list just leaked, and we found out that an old member of the crew might be featuring in this game. It's a spoiler section. It's going to be at the end, so you don't have to worry about that. But also this week, we have a rare honor to speak with Mike Gamble, a producer at BioWare, You've probably seen him if you've been following the news cycle of Mass Effect Andromeda. He gives out the little tidbits of information. He's the one that confirmed the new squad mate Jal is in fact romanceable, which people just lost their minds to. It looks like this weird kitten frog thing. Looks but apparently, like those things from the Star Wars prequels. A Twi'lek. There we go. No, they don't look like Twi'leks. Yeah, oh. I got like the big... Also Twi'leks, so let's, I don't know what you said there. They're Twi'leks, damn I thought it. I had an apostrophe. Twi'leks. Sure. All right, I'm so upset. Let's see what's happening in the world of gaming. What's new, pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. What's new, pussycat? Whoa, 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 whoa. Every week, the same tired joke, the same tired group of people. What's new, pussycat? We look at the games that are coming out between March 12th and March 19th. Now, Liam, I'm going to start with you because this next game we have mentioned... I want to say three or four times incorrectly. 14, I don't think 14. 15. I think three or four. I think three yeah. or four. And we're hyped for it every time. It's, Please continue. Uh, <laughs> Star Trek Bridge Crew, if you Whoa. haven't heard us talk about it before. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a VR experience where you get to be on the ship, on the deck, as you know any of the roles. It's you and your friends. You all sit in a room together, but you put the VR headset uh, on. And instead of you know sitting around having a boring conversation, you're sitting around... Mr. Uh, Wolf, fire. Doing that and yeah. uh, commanding the Starfleet. We'll finally have a place to put uh, Richard. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> as long as I get to play as Cisco, it'd be cool. Who? What are you talking about? In his about? cone of silence. <laughs> what is, who's Cisco? He's the captain of Deep Space Nine. Commander of Deep Space Nine, then he becomes captain. Is that part of Star, um, Star Trek? Deep Space Nine. I think, that's deep, I think that's Deep Space Nine, though. Deep Space Nine. That's a different thing, though. It's great. When's it coming out, Liam? It's going to be coming out, and we're going to get it right this time, March 14th for right. Oculus Rift, PSVR, and HTC Vive. Ooh, I got a PSVR, so maybe I should check it out. You got a couple. I do, but we should see if it's worth our time. I don't know. I got so many games. Horizon Zero Dawn, maybe get some Mass Effect in the next few days, fingers crossed, possibly. Got no time for this, but it is really cool. It's kind of like the VR game that people were uh, looking forward to. Richard Jellison, what's up next? You pick. Coming up in the next uh, seven days. So if you miss out on the Dang and Rompus series when it was on the Vita and uh, everybody except Thomas didn't, you can now catch on the PS4. Uh, in these games, you play this interactive murder thing and like people have pink mm. blood and they got to kill each other to survive. Think uh, Battle Royale plus Phoenix the movie, Wright. The movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus Phoenix Wright. So it's a big investigation on who killed who. And if you Do fail, you kill you, people? You... Well, you play as the main character who doesn't kill anybody. Spoilers. Uh, uh, but you have to figure out who killed who in this. If you uh, say spoilers after murder what mystery. you say, then it's not a spoiler. You're the main character. You know who you don't kill. 
He plays oh, like the guy. Oh, it's a mystery, so that wouldn't make yeah. a lot of sense. When's it coming out? Uh, it's coming out again on March 14th. March 14th, and then, there we uh, go. And then the 17th in Europe. Okay. And finally, the game coming out this week is Stick Shards of Darkness, uh, PC, PS4, and Xbox One. You might remember this game. I've seen a lot of ads for it. I think they're spending a lot on the marketing budget on this one. It's a stealth-based game. You play Sticks, Master of the Shadows. It's in the entry of the Orcs and Men series. I'm not as familiar with this series. Guys, you There was a little while one? back where the first Sticks game was yeah. uh, free on PlayStation. Like, if you had that PlayStation Plus membership. This is riveting, Xbox by the way. One. Yeah, no, but uh, I played it then. And I, I feel like, you know, that was a good chance for people to jump into the series because... People usually get pretty hype on those free games. I played it as well. I think I got most of the way through it. It was decent stealth mechanics. I'm not going to lie. Well, thank God he's not going to lie. It's coming out this Tuesday. All right. We got to take a quick break. When we return, of course, news of the week, discussing the stories that made our highlight reel. And then after that, of course, do not miss our special interview with Mike Gamble, producer of Bioware. We'll be right back. Man, that is some nice music. What's that from, Liam Brand? That is the remix of the uh, Shadow of Mordor music that plays at the end credits. Oh, yeah, very specific. remix. Who did the remix? I don't know. It just said remix. Just said remix. Yeah. So you're just stealing music from the internet. Yep. This is Video Game Sophistry, your weekly look at the world of gaming. Later this hour, we're going to be talking with a producer at BioWare all about Mass Effect Andromeda, some spoiler talk. I'm joined, of course, Liam Brand pressing the buttons, and Richard Jellison's here looking dapper as ever. Trying floral tie in airplanes. Yeah, it's, it's a lot going on. Hey, it looks good. It is a lot going on. You had a chance to play a little uh, some gaming recently, didn't you? Uh, yeah, I was playing um, Zelda last night and 1-2-Switch as well. Oh, what do you think? Uh, Quickly. Honestly, 1-2-Switch should have been a pack-in, and Zelda's pretty good. 1-2-Switch um, uh, isn't fun? 1-2-Switch should have been a pack-in. What does that mean? Like, the, the Switch bundled is at... With. The Switch is oh, at, it's just not yeah. bundled with? No. Really? Uh, it's not the Wii Sports. It's an yeah. extra $50 game, uh, and it should have been a pack-in. It is not worth a $50. No. My buddy even said that even if it was $20 less, he would have gotten it, but... That's str- yeah, I guess that is tough, a $50 price tag cuz you're going to if you're already spending 400, you're not going to boop that up to boop that up I said to 500 for both Zelda and 1 2 yeah. Switch. Plus yeah. whatever digital downloads like Fast Racing Remix. I don't why what are these games? Do it's like F-Zero. Games, Liam? Do you know these games Liam? Uh, yeah, I had to do that whole event for Nintendo. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know time. all the games. You know, you know them all, man. Yeah, we we have some Really just dubious connections to the industry. Weird. You cannot trust this is all. Speaking of which, News of the Week coming up right now. This Week in Gaming. I've got to do the news! So the number one story this week, I think, really has to be the announcement of a brand new game. It builds on the legacy of a game that really came out of nowhere. It used the creative laurels of, I want to say, the early to late 2000s, the popularity of Middle Earth. You know, this is a game that came out a couple of years ago that was about Middle Earth. Middle Earth Shadow of Mordor, an incredible WB title that people just loved. Monolith uh, Software delivered last time, and they're hoping to bring it again. A new Mordor game is coming out. It's got a new name. Middle Earth Shadow of War, and it promises to have some pretty cool new features. Did you really think you could kill me that easily? The spy is also able to help clear the way by sniping enemies. In Shadow of Mordor, the Nemesis system created memorable stories of bloodshed and revenge. In Shadow of War, your followers can create entirely new stories of loyalty, betrayal, rivalry, and even friendship. Gotcha. And there we have it. A brand new Middle Earth game. Guys, we're pretty excited. This was a game that I think really, like I said, came out of nowhere. It had a great audience, and it had, as we just heard, that Nemesis system... You guys are big fans of this one? Oh, yeah. I got the 100% completion on the first well, one. Well, aren't I you cool? Yeah, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, And I was saying even earlier, 
um, that once I got that hundred percent completion, I did all the DLC, and I was still like, I want to play more of this. Like mm-hmm. it was just such. A, that's a, that's a rare feat, yeah. right? Yeah, like I'm that's usually tired and done of a game at that point. Much like this show. What about you, Richard? <laughs> well, I don't like the Batman games, but this is the best Batman game I've ever played. <laughs> you don't? You mean you don't like WB's Batman? Really? No, not no. I for some reason I just didn't like how the things worked. Yeah. I didn't even like the Mad Max. Uh, like I don't know right. what it was, Richard's but a, this I okay. felt I don't know what it was because of the swords, maybe because of the yeah. setting. It was just perfect for me. You you really enjoyed the first one? Yeah. Okay. So one thing that I think is pretty amazing is this is a game we're going to be talking about Mass Effect Andromeda later in the hour and. For the last several years, we've only seen a few minutes, maybe, of that game. The very first thing, the announcement trailer for Middle Earth Shadow of War, what do we see on YouTube? 17 minute gameplay. So much. Right away. We don't even see, you know, um, these protracted story mission uh, cutscenes. It's just here is the gameplay. Liam? I love it. That's the way to do it. That's the way to get people excited. You're raising your hand. I thought you wanted to speak. Oh no, I was telling you five minutes. You were just like, oh, okay, great, <laughs> great job. Oh, they've been making this like a secret for like, <laughs> yeah. I guess, two years, mm-hmm. right? Because uh, it's this is nuts, and like they did that for Fallout Four, but I mean, mm-hmm. I think this is kind of a bigger hype announcement than uh, Fallout. 4 I just was. love the idea that that is how they introduce this with 16 minutes and it is one of the most epic i again we call it kind of lord of the rings fan fiction a little bit <laughs> as if you haven't seen the video make sure you do take a look basically you play again as talia the character from the first game and you have an army a massive massive orc army that you enslaved with your powers a theme that i really hope they you know explore mm-hmm. in the last few games because i if you do recall slight spoilers here but i think you kind of have to know this too play this game at the end of um, Shadow of Mordor there's some inklings that you as Talion are kind of becoming like Sauron mm-hmm. a bit and this time around it's more than a bit you have a dark army yourself that isn't really doing dark things you know we assume because you're still still seeking revenge but if your character was just an orc instead of a magic uh, elf dude this would be seen as kind of a bad versus bad game, don't you guys think? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, Nietzsche puts it best. Uh, Thank take God. care as you fight monsters, lest you become monster yourself. Did you get it right? Uh, I was close. Did you? Okay. Damn it. The Nietzsche police are going to be after us. After They're going to get me. <laughs> okay. So what you did get to see in the trailer was the introduction, we heard it before, of what they believed they're naming as a friendship system. So the nemesis system beforehand, as you recall from the previous game, you'd interact with some of the baddies, kill them or not, uh, let them go, and they would comment on that, kind of chase you around based on that. This time around, it's not only you as the player having this interaction with these kind of mini sub-bosses, but it's other mini sub-bosses becoming friends, getting closer. And I gotta say, you guys think we're gonna see some orc romance? Ooh, yeah, like ex-lovers coming at each other and right? stabbing each other in the back and whatnot. I don't think there's females in the game, though. Like female you orcs. You don't know that yet. There's no women in Mordor. <laughs> Italian well, single and ready to mingle. Oh, right. But there's. I don't think there are female orcs. We gotta call Stephen Colbert. Are there female orcs? Colbert. Yeah, Colbert he, is one of the most prim- yeah, eminent like, Lord of the Rings uh, historians. An encyclopedia. Okay. Wouldn't be my first pick. <sighs> You just you killing me today, <laughs> Liam. You killing me today. Well, are, are you worried a little bit about this new dynamic? Because it is like any uh, great new game, it's introducing a whole new variable set that they can just screw up very, very easily. Because those narr- like they do mention this in the gameplay that these new narrative choices are going to be fun and different and exciting. Yeah, but they're not really full fledged scripted moments as much. So it is a little bit like um, create your own story. It could go bit. south. We could end up seeing the same relationship like fifty times over. Yeah, but I didn't really see that a whole lot in Shadow of Mordor. Mm-hmm. Everybody's so. game was supposed to be a lot different because of the variables that were happening with the Nemesis system and yeah. all that. It changed your story dynamically based on that. So. It is really cool to see um, a sequel though. Just take something that worked and said, okay, we're going to double down on it. They like the nemesis system. Let's make it a friendship system. They like sieging places. Now you can really siege places. Mm -hmm. They like the, you know, the inklings of some moral ambiguity. Boom. Let's slap them right in the face with that. And they have, I think a lot of confidence with their product because we just saw almost 20 minutes of gameplay. You can also ride a dragon. Thank you. (laughs) That's like, tell me more. 
well, you like before, well, you ride a dragon. Yeah, but what more do you want to know, like, Andy? Yeah, you get on this like uh, you know mutant dog thing. I'm totally forgetting the name yeah, of it. I think it's a fish frog. Uh, yeah, fish frog. That's it. And now you know where you could ride those around and like uh, slash your sword on top of one of those. You mm-hmm. can now do that atop a dragon and also shoot fire and send those dragons to just kill everything. Just and do it's so bad great. Stuff. That is upping the ante. Bring right me there. closer. I want to hit him with my sword. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. So that is what we have so far on Shadow of War, Middle-Earth Shadow of War. It's coming out at Xbox One, PC, PlayStation 4, August 22nd. It's also a title that's coming out this year. It is so yeah. soon. We don't have to wait. We've been waiting two years. Speaking of waiting, waiting for this next game for a long time. Mass Effect Andromeda. Up next, my talk with Mike Gamble, producer on the game. We go into the nitty gritty, what you can expect, and even give some new information about... Dun, 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 dun. Not gonna. I'm not gonna tease it. You just gotta listen. Gonna be back after this. It seems like we've waited 600 years for this upcoming title. Every week here on VGS, we talk about Mass Effect. Whether it is with the writers of the first three games, some of the producers that made that wonderful combat we love, and we haven't had a chance yet to speak about Mass Effect Andromeda with the people who are making it. Today, that all changes. We're very fortunate to have Mike Gamble on, producer at BioWare. You've probably seen him on Twitter and gotten some key info from Andromeda through that. Mike, thank you for joining the program. Well, thanks for having me. So how does it feel? I feel like I've been hearing about Andromeda for years. It's gold. It's out the door. How does it feel for your, uh, you and the team that's been working on it? Well, I mean, it's it's, it's mixed, right? Because yeah. you're happy it's done. You've been working on it for what seems like 600 years, yeah. um, but it's it's we're just waiting to see what the fans think. You know, we feel really good about it. We're happy about it. We we think it's going to be a, you know what everyone hoped for, but you never really know until mm. you know the millions of people dig into it. So th- there's anticipation, but it's it's a healthy anticipation. It's such an interesting position that you're in with this game when there's such love of the previous franchise and you've decided to not really continue with the exact same formula but make some changes like you said it you really want to make sure that the fans that live and die by these games still love it i guess yeah yeah i mean you you think about what we did before it was it was something amazing with the trilogy and and a lot of people kind of grew up playing playing RPGs and really felt that the trilogy was strong and, and we're really proud of it. But at the same time, you know, stories have to end and you have to move on. And we looked at Mass Effect and we're such big fans of the IP and we know that there's so many stories to tell. We wanted to make that fresh start, that clean break between the original games and this one. And, you know, originally in doing so, it was, it was kind of scary, right? Because you're off in, in uncharted waters, pun intended. And you've got, you've got all these, these cool things that people love about the, the franchise, but you also want to tell a different story, right? So, you know, we just worked hard to make sure that it was mass effect enough, but also unique enough on its own two legs. And, uh, yeah, and I think we were able to do it. It's a pretty interesting thing to look at how the, um, I guess, the messaging for this game has been sent out in the last six months to a year. I remember when Mass Effects 1 through 3 came out, all we did was wait for the big trailers, and that was pretty much all the information we got. You go through the forums trying to get some more info now. It (laughs) seems like there's been a bit of a shift where people like you and Aaron Flynn and Mac Walters and your online social media presence are giving a lot of really key, I guess it would be tidbits, because you're not really giving anything away, but that key information about the game that you can't really find anywhere else. Yeah. I'm, I'm eager to know, you know, was this something that you guys talked about, or was this just kind of a natural progression of the times, of this is how people kind of get their information now? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was kind of a natural thing. Yeah. When you look at how, how games and how movies and everything are, are, are marketed now, um, you know, it, it's totally different than it was 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. And like you said, they had the, the more traditional kind of big trailer releases and then people talk about it and then they wait for another one. Social media has changed everything, right? And so I can it's, – it's just as good for me because I get to talk to the fans, right? And I get to see what they want, what they like, what they don't like. You know, that kind of dialogue – 
is is pretty rewarding. So, yeah, we like to talk about the game with yeah. with the folks, and and you know, re- releasing information is is part of that, I guess, right? We'll get to it in a little bit, I hope. But I remember, I think in the last month or so, when you released some information about the new uh, race and the new squad mates and the possible romance connections with that of just yeah. people, the fans exploding, already making art just because of the <laughs> little piece of information you're giving them. Yeah, no, that's, that's our fans. That's massive <laughs> fans. It's, it's awesome. It's funny. Some of the fan art is, is I mean, most of the fan art is just incredible. Mm-hmm. But then you get into fan fiction. And then you got to be careful around fan fiction because you start to get into those deep, dark crevices of the internet. And you never want to come back. <laughs> Some of the stuff that's in fan fiction. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. All right, so let's let's dive right in to Andromeda. You've uh, worked, if I if I am correct, on um, a lot of the previous Mass Effect games as well, right? Yeah. Yep. Mass Two and Three. Okay. So the team, there's a big gap in between Mass Three and Andromeda. Do you remember? Do you have any recollection of when this sort of trajectory? of a whole new, you're going to Andromeda, it's going to be completely removed in a lot of ways from the first three games when that was first talked about. Because it is such, we're used to it now, but it's a very um, interesting choice for a series that has so much love and cachet to basically say, you know what, we're going to a whole new place, different characters. I'd love to know a little bit about that backstory. Well, the decision was actually made, uh, let me see now, about five years ago. Really? Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. From the very beginning, this was the plan. We, we decided to go in this direction. And everything was built from the ground up with this in mind. Because we knew, we knew a couple things. So we knew that, that the you know, separate story was done. Um, we knew that the Citadel DLC kind of paid off a lot of the fan mm-hmm. service, for lack of a better word, for a lot of the characters. So that was, we were tying bows around these things. And at the same time, we were spinning up ideas for the new game. And then, of course, we decided to move to Frostbite. And so it only seemed natural that, that we take a lot of these, these ideas that we've been spinning around and formalize that into something that's brand new. There was never like a, a moment where we switched gears. It was always, no, nope, we want to do something different. We want to do something new. Now, where it took place was not always decided, right? That kind of came out naturally through the, the development process of like, well, what's the what's the coolest setting that we could do that's still, you know, feasible technology wise in the IP. And Andromeda kind of came out of that. Yeah. Let's talk yeah. more about what we know already about Mass Effect Andromeda. You're introducing for me anyway, this is a, a newer system that seems to be just really flushed out in the last few videos, almost a sense of a meta game in some ways with the Nexus and your role of exploring the Andromeda galaxy. Right off the bat, what exactly am I talking about for those that are uninitiated and don't know what I'm referencing? So this is it's kind of a, uh, like you said, a metagame is a good way of, of describing it. Um, a big theme of Andromeda is exploration and, you know, kind of making a new home for yourself in, in Andromeda. So as you go throughout Andromeda, you're looking for areas of settlement. And those areas of settlement are either viable or not viable. And through, through big kind of story spoilery things, you can change the viability of these potential homeworlds in Andromeda. And by doing that, that allows you to do things like place settlements and, and introduce new people to life in Andromeda in this cluster. And another thing that happens at the same time of that is you unlock people from this um, nexus stasis, right, or these, these Hyperion stasis. So you bring a whole bunch of people with you, but they're not all unfrozen at the beginning because for story reasons, you have nowhere to go. So as you find settlements and as you, as you find places for you to, to, to go, you start to unthaw more and more of the, of the colonialists mm-hmm. or the colonists rather, not colonialists. Um, and that gives you different perks, different opportunities in the game to unlock certain things, give you different bonuses and, and, and different access to different weapons and armor and things like that. So that kind of sits all on top of, and we call that AVP, and drama of viability, viability points. Yeah. And that sits on top of basically this, this uh, colonization theme that we have. Well, I love that idea just because it almost seems like the natural progression of what you guys have been developing in Bioware games for a long time. When it comes to the idea of choice, is there no more choice than how you will chart 
almost existence in this whole new universe. I do have a few questions just about that system of what you can say. And again, there's a lot here that you're not going to be able to answer. I tried to tell some of the fans when I went to Reddit and said, oh, I'm talking to you. What do you want, want to know? He's not going to answer any of those. So um, <laughs> first and foremost, those characters that you are opening, these um, different people that you're taking out of cryo, are they active characters or they work just kind of as um, stock points essentially like, like are these people you can talk to or are they kind of just in the machine of uh the nexus uh a little bit of both yeah so some of them you'll be like oh that that person wasn't there before and i can talk to them and you know this person's family is getting on five so so in some cases you can definitely in most cases it's part of the the machinery but you will see more population kind of come mm -hmm. in through the nexus throughout the, the course of the game you'll see it more and more populated you'll see the populations of your outposts um, uh, obviously when you when you place the outpost you'll see the population of them kind of filter in there so there, there's there's visual elements of it for sure uh, the majority of it is mm -hmm. kind of on the back end is part of the old the, the overall meta of it now, does that contribute to some kind of end game state of what you can say, or is this? Uh, it doesn't really work like that. <laughs> no, no. The, 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 <clears throat> what can I say without spoiling anything? Please, yeah, please don't, uh, because I personally I would be upset. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, I'm not going to say a hell of a lot. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, leave it there with that one. Um, we did see in one of the latest exploration videos, which I think was the moment that I got the most excited about this game. There's a mention that there are over a hundred planets that you can interact with in some way, and a handful you can explore. I have pretty big hands. Some people I know have small hands. <laughs> Any anything close to a number on that one? Well, no, we, we don't. We don't want to give numbers. Sure. But, but but how about this? Um, uh, when people are thinking about the size of the game, it is it is massive compared to Mass Effect Three. Mm -hmm. It is it is at least double of what Mass Effect Three is. So the number of planets aside, the amount of stuff that you can do on each of these planets is huge. And Fast. that's what I think that's what I think the fans are gonna love. Yeah, so if you could, what's an example of something that you could do on one of these new planets that you see? Because I remember Mass Effect one the early on of exploring in the Mako as being one of the most interesting gaming experiences I had of that time. And what we've seen so far, it seems like you can kind of get something close to that, if not more immersive. Oh, hey, for sure. So, okay, I'll give you an example of, of one kind of meta quest. So, so there's this there's this planet called Eladin, and this this planet is extremely close to a sun, and it's where a lot of shady characters kind of hang out. But of course, the planet is hot, really hot, almost unbearably hot, and they have a water problem. And so, when you get down onto this planet, you kind of meet the local people, and you find out what their their current plights are and what's what's going on there. And you find out that there's this, this extreme water problem on the planet, and it's actually hinging a lot of different, uh, the success of a lot of different uh, factors. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you, you sort out what's going on with the water. And this, this quest takes you to all different parts of the planet, into caves, into dungeons, into, you know, mm -hmm. an outlaw flop house. It'll take you all over. That's just an example of one of the kinds of things that you'll be doing on these planets. So fairly massive um, involved story-driven quests on the planet. Fascinating. This, I know, uh, is one of the first games where you've thrown away the idea of Paragon and Renegade. The example you give there, will there be choices that we could make that could possibly lead to very different outcomes for that planet Elodin? Or is it kind of similar to the original trilogy wherein Commander Shepard had one prime objective. You're not going to be ruining planets, I guess, mm -hmm. in Indra. Or will you? I don't know. <laughs> no, no. I mean, you don't ruin planets, but um, oftentimes when you have these kind of decisions, you, you can't make everyone happy. You have to choose. You have to figure out what's best for you as a player and the kind of things that are important to you. So there will always be people who, for some way or another, you haven't been able to satisfy and sometimes at the expense of other people. In the water quest that I gave the example, that's kind of one of those things. Mm. So you get that there. Fascinating. Again, speaking with Michael Gamble, producer on Bioware, all about Mass Effect Andromeda. When I think about what this game could offer from what we've seen so far in terms of the narrative experience and some of the greater themes it explores, it seems it is perched in a position, Andromeda, 
to talk about something that we haven't really seen talked about a lot in video games, especially not effectively, and that's the notion of colonization. It, here in Canada, it's a hugely important and impactful part of our Canadian history, the, yep. the heritage that we have here and throughout North America. I would love to know, without giving anything away, will we be making choices that are similar to some of the choices that almost every sort of colonizing force had to make in the history of the world? I, I really would love to know how deep this goes. Well, it is definitely a, a major theme of the game, and and some of those choices are pretty spoilery. So, so I don't want to I don't want to ruin it. Of course but, not. Uh, for us, it was really important um, to to kind of distinguish between colonizing and finding a new home, and and being empirical or uh, imperialist mm. rather. Yeah. Um, you, you know, invading and going in guns blazing into a, a new place was absolutely by far. The, the last thing that we wanted to to showcase with this, right? It's more about the sense of exploration, the sense of survival, and really playing into that. So, of course, you know, and you'll see this in the game when you meet the the inhabitants of the Helios cluster. Uh, they don't know how to take you, and you don't know how to take them. So, kind of figuring that story out, and and you know, seeing how that plays out throughout the course of the game is actually one of the major themes that we have. And we really want to lean into that. And, and you know, it, it does have an effect mm-hmm. on the choices that you make. That's what I'm looking for. As long as they, that you actually talked about that, you know, I, I'm thinking of other games that dealt with that issue effectively. And they're kind of few and far between. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, this is, this is a big part of what the game is about. And I think it would have been, we would have done a fairly big disservice had we not mm-hmm. put it front and center in terms of our consideration. So we're moving from the sense of exploration. Is there anything else that you think we really haven't covered with what you can do in terms of exploring in the Andromeda galaxy? Well, I mean, your, your freedom of choice is, is massive. Mm-hmm. So the, the, the types of things, your player agency, we call it. So the things that you can do on a moment-to-moment basis are pretty wide. And this is why I say it's so much bigger than the previous games, like the Mass Effect 3, because you know, at any given time, you can okay, well, am I going to pursue a relationship with this person or am I going to actually go after their loyalty? Or maybe actually I'm going to go onto this planet and do this different quest to do this thing. Or maybe I'm going to, I'm going to go fight the cat. Or maybe I'm going to play multiplayer. Or maybe I'm going to engage with strike teams. There's so many different things, different choices that the player can do at any given time. And I mean, that's, that's, that's probably, of all the things, the most rewarding aspect of the game. And, of course, that ties beautifully into our theme of exploration, right? Mm-hmm. So yeah. it's, it's less about you know, uncharted planets, and that's a big part of it, but it is more, what do you as a player want to do? How do you want to play this game? Mm-hmm. That's the big thing. Fascinating. So we go from that, and I think this continues, this theme continues in how gameplay is expressed. I have some fond memories of being cloistered in a small corner and just trying to throw singularities uh, behind <laughs> cover in uh, the Mass Effect series. Now you're offering something very different in terms of how quick fast pace it is the flow of combats and the ability to customize for someone that is very familiar with the old ways i'm very fortunate i get to talk to you about this i'm a little bit worried because i'm so used to playing it the other way what can you say to me about the ease of combat for someone that really looks forward to the way the games used to be played Uh, okay well yeah one of those guys i know I, no, no. They, you, there's a lot of you guys. There's a couple million of you guys. Yeah. So, so, uh, for me, honestly, I, I originally looked at it like, oh, should, should, should we change it that much? But as you start to get these individual features and systems into the game, they gel together beautifully, right? So, so this sense of hunkering down behind cover and you know, having, a, having a battle of basically attrition with the enemies, that's, that's still in there. In fact, on insanity and, and the higher difficulties, you basically kind of have to do that. The only difference really is that now you can take cover behind a whole bunch of different stuff instead of crates, right? And, and more importantly, you don't know when the combats are necessarily going to happen. You go into a, a, a field that it has you know, rocks scattered about and there's the edge of a cliff and you've got your nomad in front of you. And then a cat dropship swoops in and then starts to deploy enemies. We couldn't have done that in the trilogy because we would have had to do a, you know, a, yeah. a, a 
crate based lay, uh, you know cover layout and you would have known it, it telegraphed it so that that makes it more interesting that way what um, go ahead so so jump and dash though that's kind of the big the big game changers and that's probably the stuff that people are like they're wondering the most about all it does is it gives you more strategic advantages in the battlefield so the ai will will attack you based on their roles so some people will flank you some people will kind of push on you but it, the the jump and dash gives you an opportunity to reposition yourself and to do a more strategically based based fight. And once you've got it, I promise you, you will never want to go back. That was, that was kind of the original thing that we saw with it. And now that I play Mass 3, I could never go back to not having the ability to jump. All right. Got a, got a guarantee from Gamble himself. So that's, that means something. <laughs> the one also very striking in that same video series where you go through it is just the difference of environments. I think almost every major fight that we got to see so far in Andromeda was amidst these beautiful mountains and these palatial views that is not something that i really recall from mass effect one two and three it's very much corridor you know hallway kind of shooting is that the type of fights we can expect in andromeda a lot of more bigger set piece kind of action yeah i mean you've got you've got both things right you've got you're scrambling onto a cat ship to shut down the generator right you've got tight linear corridor based shooter action but then, of course, you've got, okay, I'm in the middle of, of Vol, the giant ice planet, and the snowstorm is beating down, and it's, it's eroding my, my hazard protection, and I've got cat dropships coming in from over the mountain. Like, so you've got both of these kind of things that you can play in. It just depends on what you feel at that point. Um, we, we did pay a lot of attention to make these, these explorable worlds as gorgeous and beautiful as possible. We, you know, and they're, they're not all lush jungles, right? You can still have a lot of beauty in, in as we know in Canada, in stark wasteland type coldness. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it, we, we want to go for that for pretty much all the plants. And I think we have a good sampling of the types of, you know, biomes and locales that players would expect to, to discover. Continuing with that, uh, that line of thought, you've said before, and some representatives for the game have said before, this is not a traditional open world game. And you still, though, from what we've seen, are on these planets. So how, how would you specify what this game is in terms of the places that you'll go? Because I think it is, is it very similar more to Dragon Age Inquisition, or where would you place it, I guess? Well, I mean, it, it is its own unique thing, and this is, this is why we haven't really, really uh, wanted to classify it, because we're not a sandbox game where you have a large, contiguous open world, and then you, you do various uh, quests or fetch quests and stuff like that. That's, that's not the kind of game that we're trying to make. So you have these large explorable spaces, and the Nomad is really good at letting you go from point A to point B on it. But we do tell scripted, you know, detailed narratives throughout these areas. Mm-hmm. Um, we wanted to eliminate as much as possible the idea of the old fetch quest or the old, you know, gather a hundred whatever butterflies and... and yes, yeah, butterflies, like, yeah. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Uh, you know, we, we didn't really want that. And that's what people associate a lot with open world games. So instead, you have these massive planets and the stories to explore on these planets. But each of these planets are kind of their own thing. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you've got your linear game. You've got your, your crit path, which takes you to these, these you know, uh, more, I wouldn't say closed off, but more linear type, sure. type worlds, right? So sure. like I said before with, this, with the, the giant uh, dropship, you know, that would be an example of a crit path kind of thing. Um, we have both of those, and then we have squad loyalty. So, so in the confines of just a traditional sandbox open world games, you don't get those other experiences that people have come to expect from Mass Effect. Mm-hmm. And the big thing for us is that you do still have those, right? Yeah, no, it's just from what we've seen, it's really, really appealing, the idea that you can be on a planet and just literally explore and, uh, you know, cover a field. And I even love the idea that, you've made this in a way where you can know how much you've done. There's a lot of percentages to completing planets and there's, there's a lot of systems in place because there's nothing I hate more than you entering an open world game or a big game and you're not certain how complete you really are. Yeah. Yeah. And it does look like there's a a big system in place there. Um, Speaking of trying to do everything, the combat system with profiles and skills from what we've seen so far, it seems like you can essentially be any sort of traditional Mass Effect um, archetype that we're used to from the previous three games. 
Is this an attempt to streamline it, or does this actually make it more complex? In my opinion, it makes it complex. And yeah. it's actually just going back to that player agency thing that I brought up before. It's about giving you choice. So, so to be clear, I think you said this, you can play as you know the, the, the old class type loadout that you had before. Mm-hmm. If you want to play as an infiltrator, you can. But if you put enough points into other kind of quote-unquote competing classes, you can open up profiles which allow you to switch to those. Now, every combat situation may work differently with a different type of profile. So if you approach a, a enemy base and there's a lot of towers and they're, they're in those towers and they have long line of sight, well, your soldier that you've been building up over time may not be really effective in that. You could probably, you know, soldier out, but you're probably going to be better based with an infiltrator or a vanguard type class. So if you have that, you switch that profile and you can attack that tower that way. And then you've taken the tower out. Okay, now what are you going to do? Well, a lot of the enemies are being reinforced from the eastern flank. All right, I'm going to look at the engineer profile, switch to that, and take more of a, def- a defensive uh, stance. Before, when you were just a soldier, you'd have to approach each of those scenarios in the exact same way. But in, in Andromeda, you have the ability to choose. And so that makes the, the combat a lot more dynamic, as we said before. And it does make the strategy in them a lot a lot more, right? So yeah, no. I'm, I'm quite a fan. Um, from what you've seen, because you've probably seen so many people play this game and all the, the Q&A that you need to do with it. I'm concerned that if I was in that seat, and again, I don't have the game in my hands, so I gotta, you're the expert on this, that I would be so comfortable just playing one particular way. What are you doing for people like me to be enticed to sort of play different ways, to go out of my adept little bubble and try to play a different way? Well, the combat scenarios that get thrown at you, well, in, in many cases, force you. To oh, okay, interesting. Adapt, you know, um, as I said before, it is more, more agile and you have a lot more space to move around. So when the, the, the enemies are thrown at you, uh, all the scenarios that you have, your, your traditional profile that you have might not work. So it depends on what profile you have. But if you're an engineer, for example, and you're being flanked from above, that's probably going to get you killed unless you really click or unless you switch profiles, right? So we are encouraging the players to, to do that. But as I said before, if you really want to be rigid with your own role playing, because that's everyone's individual choice, you can. You can. And we don't want to punish you for the kind of weapons that you have or the kind of armor that you can wear. It's, it's something about accessibility, and that's really important. I do not envy the amount of variables you guys got to deal with now. I, I, I thought it was a lot just dealing with dialogue and different character developments. Now you're bringing in a whole other thing with they can play any sort of way they want. It, it almost seems like for the uninitiated, again, like it's, it's too much for one game to handle. <laughs> well, that's why there's multiple playthroughs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go, right? There's different ways to play. Again, speaking with Michael Gamble, producer on BioWare, all about Mass Effect Andromeda, covered what we're doing in terms of exploration, how we're fighting. Now we're going to spend just a little bit of time talking about maybe one of the biggest draws for any Mass Effect game, the characters. When Do you think that's a fair statement for a lot of people who love Mass Effect? Oh, yes. Yeah, that is by far the... the the Mass Effect staple, the characters. Okay, so we're on the same page with that. This time around, if I am correct, there are six different squad mates you can choose from that have been released so far, the information that has been given out, along with the duality of um, your counter-sibling, your father. There's a, there's a lot of moving parts in this way. Yeah, when I remember the gameplay that I really loved in games like Mass Effect 2 and other games, there was 12, 15 maybe different squad mates to choose from, just so much. Why this time around is the roster just a little bit smaller, seemingly, from the information we have? Well, um, there's a couple of reasons, really. So, so if you, the, the one that you're, you're referring to was Mass Effect 2. Mass Effect 2 had 12. Because the theme around Mass Effect 2 was the Dirty Dozen, right? It was yeah. a tight story, and it was about how that story related only to your characters. That was the big thing about it. Andromeda, we've got such a larger uh, palette of things to do, uh, so much more adventure that you can have, that we wanted to limit the characters down to a number where we could really create cool, engaging relationships between you and the characters, and between the characters themselves, mm-hmm. right? So 
you'll be on the Tempest, which is your ship, and you'll hear the characters chatting or arguing or bickering about something or another. The level of detail that we're able to get to those characters, because we have six of them, um, is a lot more than we could if we had to spread that out over so many more characters, right? And remember that the amount of content, the amount of story content that we have, the amount of things that your character can react to, it was probably not even doable with that many, you know, 10 plus characters, right? So we really Mm -hmm. wanted to focus and make those six core to the experience. Do you have any of the, I imagine, numerations and calculations of, you know, lines of dialogue that people salivate to at this point in the the marketing of the game? Do you know how many lines of dialogue they have for some of the big uh, characters, the uh, squad mates, rather? Yeah, I mean, I I know. We'll probably release that after launch. (laughs) Okay, all right, yeah. Those cool infographics. Sure. But but it's more than Mass Effect 3 ever had. That's for damn sure. Okay. In terms of the characters, just because... For those listening right now who are not familiar, a quick rundown of the squad mates, if you could. Uh, okay, so we've got we've got um, a Krogan Drac. So Drac is he's old and he's he's seen some stuff and he's got a lot to share with you there. Uh, we've got Jal, who's an Angara, and so the Angara are a new species um, in Helios, one of the ones that you meet and kind of gaining their their appreciation and gaining their trust is, is a big part of what the game is about. Um, we've got Cora. So Cora's, she's human. Uh, she's kind of your right hand. Uh, you see her as, as the, the militaristic, very regimented type person that you aren't as Ryder, because Ryder's very casual, right? Um, you've got Liam Costa. So he's worked as security back, back in the Milky Way, and, and he's with you from the start. He's human as well. Uh, who, oh, you've got Vetra. So Vetra, she's very, she's about operations. She's your, she's your space mom. Mm-hmm. She's got, she's got all the information that you need to know. Um, she's very family oriented. That comes out in the, in the, the game, as well. And I think I'm missing. I think I got them all. I think that, yeah, I think that's so. Yeah. That is that. Um, just I don't know if you can release information. Are that all the squad mates that you're releasing right now, or is that all the squad mates available, or is it the same answer? <laughs> well, that's all we're talking about, right? Okay, there we go. <laughs> that's what I got. So just from the, the six you've described, what would you identify as your favorite? Because you've had so yeah. many time with this. I know it's like picking kids, but I, I think there are people that kind of that are drawn to one Bioware character a little more than another. Oh, yeah. Um yeah, I've got my favorites. I, I did forget PB. PB was of course. Here, sorry, Excuse me. yeah. She's she's the the uh, fun archaeologist type. So between those six, hmm, my personal favorite is Jaw. Uh, yeah. Jaw or Drac. See, I, I really like Drac because he's got. I mean, I'm a huge fan of Krogans, but but Drac is different than the other Krogans that we've met in that he's he's extremely wise. He's really old, and he, he has a lot to teach you. But he still sticks with you, right? And he's very loyal. Yeah. And of course, Jal. Jal is just, he's awesome. I, I always love kind of infiltrator style sniper characters. Mm-hmm. Jal excels at that. He's got this really cool cloak ability. He's, he's just, he's, he's super cool. And how he fits into the overall relationship between you and the Angara people, really, really a fan of him. It seems like he might be, or that you guys might be channeling a little bit of Thane there with uh, how you've been able to describe him. Ah, yeah, he's, he's, yeah, yeah, I don't want to ruin much. <laughs> please don't, please don't, again, because that sounds like a great, I do know, I think it was you or maybe one of your colleagues, when there was a lot of excitement about the possibility to romance this new alien species, that I, I think it might have been you, went to social media and really pushed the idea, like, you guys have no idea how, like, possibly appealing it would be for this character. For a lot. Was that you or am I mistaken? <laughs> Yeah, 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 that's me. <laughs> okay, all right. So that that ties in naturally to just the idea of new species. I always love talking to people like you and, and the team behind it that are making new species. What can you tell us really about the Angara and how they fit into the Mass Effect story that we've seen so far? It seems like new species in Mass Effect always need to give something to the story. They they add something to the diverse pie. What mm-hmm. do the Angara add that you can share, obviously? Well, uh, the, the biggest thing is that Helios was a place before we ever got there, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, it didn't start to exist when, when the arcs pulled up. So they have been, they have been uh, for, uh, I don't want to say, a number of years in Helios, 
living in Helios and experiencing the problems of Helios. Mm -hmm. And you were just a newcomer to these problems. You are not, you are not, you know, anything special. You kind of just stumble upon them. So the Angara in our game, they really ground us in the ability to see what things were like when we weren't there. Mm -hmm. And you can use that reflection a lot. And, you know, their relationship with the cat and their relationship with, um, you know, various kind of uh, 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 phenomenon inside Helios. Um, they make you realize that they've been struggling and they've been fighting the good fight for a long time. And you're just there as a bystander. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in terms of their, their species, they're very proud. Um, They are, they are technologically advanced. They are spacefaring and they're cautious. Mm -hmm. And that really adds a lot, I think, to, to what the story of Andromeda is. I just love listening to you very meticulously choose your words when describing the species. <laughs> I love it. No, I understand. But um, okay, so we have your squad mates. We understand a little bit of the premise of the story. How important is it for your team and the team working on Andromeda to have these characters seem alive with each other? Because I think the previous games were really good at making these characters interact well with Shepard. Mm-hmm. I think in the third one, we got to the point where they seem like they're really good with interacting with each other in their own kind of ambient relationships. Is that focus still in Andromeda where your team really interacts with each other and it kind of feels like a team? Yeah. Back, back to the, the, the notes about why six or yeah. why, why at least six. So we, doing that allows us to focus in on some of those relationships between them. Right. Even the squad on the Tempest, people who are locked together for months and months and months, they develop relationships, they develop issues with each other. And so we want to be able to write to those, to explore those, um, because it just gives it this sense of sometimes family, sometimes, you know, we're, we're competing with each other. Um, yeah, definitely something that we have to, to, or we had to look at. You spend a lot of time in the Nomad as well when you're driving around. So we also wanted to give the player stories and interactions between you and the squad in the Nomad, right? Because it's three of you packed into this tight, uh, tight vehicle cruising around the desert or the jungle. You know, there's a lot of time for you to be able to build these relationships and for your squad to build, build the relationships between them. So, you know, t- just today I was, I was driving through one of the planets and I heard Liam and Vetra going at each other. Um, Liam was, was accusing Vetra of something and Vetra was defending it. And it was really cool. That's what we get to do with this. Oh, you're killing me. That means I got to play this game 30 times. Damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, again, that, that is very much, I think, and I think the folks at Bioware are aware of that. It ties into why people love these games. The idea that these characters are alive, that not only can you make your own personal choices in terms of how you play the game, explore, but little choices like that of who you bring, how they interact, and um, your inferences in that relationship. You talked about the squad on the Tempest, maybe outside of your actual squad mates. Are we going to be interacting with, and I think we did that in Mass Effect 1, 2, and 3, a lot of sort of ancillary characters on a more common basis, the people that work on the ship and the people that work uh, in the Andromeda initiative. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, and is that role kind of developed more? Cause I think in the third game it was brought about and there was moment you come there to talk to them once. Is this a little bit more? Yeah, definitely. So, so again, part of the writing budget goes to these individuals. I see, I see Suvi and Kahlo as part of the squad personally. Like yeah. they're the pilots of the Tempest and, and navigation, but but they're part of it. And, and Gil, the engineer, I feel as though those are all part of my squad, just as much as the dudes who I can take on the missions themselves. And you know, you, you have you have moments with them. You have relationship progression. They comment on the things that you and the other squad members have done. That's that's it's it's key. And I think without that, you wouldn't really feel like you're this 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 family yeah. going, going on this adventure, right? And remember, the Tempest is a lot smaller than the, the Normandy in terms of its overall size. So you're all kind of jammed in there a lot tighter, and there's a lot more that you can see because of that, right? Are there any severe loading screens going to every layer of the ship to talk to all your uh, companions no, after no. a big thing? No, we, we uh, our designer, Jess, Jessica Campbell, yeah. she's, she's done amazing work on the Tempest to make it so that there's very little 
um, waiting, if, if none, for me to get from one point to another. Yeah. It's all part of building the, the space in a very, very smart way for streaming and all that kind of stuff that happens. So definitely. <laughs> Again, thank you for the patience for that last question there. But <laughs> I, I think about, again, the characters in the story and the, the themes that you talked about there of a family. No more strongly in the Mass Effect franchise have we dealt with the concepts of family before than it seems like we will in Andromeda with the dad figure and, of course, the brother and sister. How deep does that theme really go in Andromeda? As deep as you want it to. So, yeah. again, back to player agency. There's a lot of stuff that you can, you can find out about your dad, about your sibling, about your, your mom even. Um, if you want, you can ignore it all if you want, but it's there. And it definitely plays into it. And you have the choice to you know, go talk to your sibling. You have the choice to interact with your sibling and share stories. You have the, the opportunity to find out more about your past, who you are, mm-hmm. and, and what you do and what you did. But of course, if you don't want to, you don't yeah. know at all. Right? But it, there's a lot of um, kind of background database stuff that you can dive into if you want to. For sure. Yeah. So, and it's not, just, it's not just passive. There's sure. definitely player action in it, for sure. So let's look now at a natural extension of all that. We talked about the team. We talked about the squad. Makes you've been very patient with us right now. Um, the idea of romance in this game. I think of, when you think of game romance, I think the first name that comes to mind is Bioware. It's always been something that's a staple with most of your RPG titles, and it's developed and changed and really offered something that you don't really find in other games. Is that the same this time around? Will there be romance options without, of course, revealing them that will surprise us, that will again kind of push the envelope of what we've seen before? Yeah, I think so. Um, You can... So we have... have, uh, uh, so I, I mentioned the, the dialogue wheels changes before, and so now it's really obvious when you're flirting with a character. So we've built in that into many characters that you, you might not expect, right? So, of course, you'd be able to expect uh, to, to romance with some of your squad members, mm-hmm. but you might not know that you've been able to romance with other squad members, or, or sorry, other people throughout the, the, the cluster. So we've definitely broadened it out, and I'd like to say that the relationships seem more organic in that it's less about you just running around talking to everyone to make sure you've, you've ticked their, their box yeah. and more about you, you know, organically trying to develop this as you go through the missions, as you go through some of the side content, as you go through your adventure, right? Will there be, and again, from what you can say, I do think that Bioware has a great history of offering relationships that are considered alternative, that are things that haven't been really covered in this medium like they should be. You mentioned a little bit there, but just to, to push the point a bit, will there be relationship options that maybe aren't as typical A, B, A, B, C? You know, just what is the amount of variety from what you can share in terms of that gameplay mechanic? Well, I mean, we're, we're giving options for different people. Um, and, you know, essentially for us, it's, it's all of our fans come from different walks of life and we want to make sure that we can can give them the proper options to role play the way that they want to and i think we've we've done an excellent job in in andromeda and and we started kind of that with the the trilogy and and the progression towards that i think it's 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 in the game in the sense that if you sure yeah if the best way to say it you can romance however you want in this game. There are options for you to basically romance in any way. And the players that want gay romance, for example, lesbian romance, it's, it's basically all in there. And I think that the progression that we've had over the last seven years as an industry has been extremely positive. And I, I, I believe that Mass Effect Andromeda is basically on the cusp of being able to do that really well. Excellent. When you think about the narrative in the story, and I guess we're not going to dive into any sort of story spoilers, but in terms of the squad mates, can you think of one moment that just really, really resonated with you, with your squad mates that you could share that would get people, I guess, a little bit excited about uh, either reliving that or getting something a little close? Yeah. Um, so there's a moment later in the game when, when you get to meet Joel's mom. 
And I don't think it's something that we've ever done before in any of the games. So it's really that you meet one of your squad members' family. Yeah, and that is just an amazing moment where you get to see, the, each, you know, you see Jaw reflected in her and you see the Angarm people reflected in her. And it's just this tender, subtle moment that you get to have. And it, it's, it's quite magical. There's a lot of those moments in the game that, mm. that I think we can't wait to share with people. It must be a little bit of a double-edged sword at this point because I there's no fans that I've communicated more with more that seem as rabid as Mass Effect fans to get every shred of information. But this is a game wherein if we had all this information, it wouldn't be the experience that we want. Yep. <laughs> so I that line for you, you know, just outside of the game development, where is that line for the information you are willing to give before uh, the game comes out? It's, it's moving day by day. Oh, is it? Okay. It, Interesting. It, it kind of, really? It, it kind of depends on what the fans want to see. So we have to be really careful as to not spoil it. But you, yeah. you, know, you probably know a lot of what makes Mass Effect Mass Effect is those special moments that are kind of woven mm-hmm. in, in the story and the inspiration and all the things that we do. But the problem is we can't share all of it. Otherwise, people will be yeah. spoiled, right? Yeah. So. So we stick to the stuff that we can easily share, like combat, like the, the, the major themes of the game, and you know, talking about the characters at a high level. But, but we actually want players to be able to discover a lot of this stuff and you know, cheer when they're playing the game or smile and, you know, or laugh. You know, and that's, that's stuff that you can easily sell. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So we only have a little bit more time with Michael. He's been very gracious, giving us uh, a lot of time here. I would be remiss if I didn't ask a little bit about, of course, the multiplayer. Over the last week, we've got to see a lot more about what the multiplayer experience will be in Mass Effect Andromeda. Um, for those, again, that are not familiar, what, how would you describe it uh, from the information that has been released so far? So you've got, you've got the, the foundation that Mass Effect 3 had for multiplayer, right? The ability to play as the other aliens in this sector. Um, so you start with that, and then you build on it. So the way that we've built on it the, the progression system has changed, which we'll share later in, in multiplayer. Um, obviously, you can, you can play as the, the Angara, and you play as part of this Apex Force. So this Apex Force is part of the, the, the for lack of a better word, police in Andromeda. Um, there's a lot of stuff that's going on in the cluster, so, so you need that force. And the way that it ties back to the main game is you, you have this, this idea of strike teams. Now, strike teams are things that you can send uh, you know, a team on, on the single player side and have them take some time and come back and bring you rewards. Or you can, get, you can jump into those strike teams yourself with other players and play the strike teams out. So that connection is really cool. And then some of the rewards will go back and forth between multiplayer and single player. Mm-hmm. Not, not at a one for one. So if you gain a, a weapon in single player, you'll get the same weapon in multiplayer. That's not what I'm saying. It's more of a, there's an economy of rewards that kind of go back and forth between strike teams and single player. Mm-hmm. It seems I mean, like it's it holistic. Really cool. it's, sorry, it, just, it seems like it's a very holistic approach, at least. Definitely. Uh, uh. It, we, we, we've tied it together in a way where, you know, it's not required for you to play. It's not required for you to, to play multiplayer to get, you know, the ending or anything like that. You kind of learned from most of you in the past. Yeah. Um, it's just a really good um, uh, extra set of features for the game. And the progression system is extremely addicting. I've been playing multiplayer for, for a couple months now, and I, yeah. I can't wait to play when everyone else it. I guess it yeah you're waiting for the people that you know are better than you right <laughs> oh, yeah. within, I've been playing the game for five years and I guarantee you within one week people are going to be able to kick my butt <laughs> well a huge thank you to Michael Gamble producer at Bioware talking all about Mass Effect Andromeda when the game does come out because it is close it, it almost seems unreal it, it's so close <laughs> yeah. what do you hope players get once the credits roll of this experience you guys have been working so hard there's i think such high expectations at this point for this game mm-hmm. what do you really hope someone like me and, and the people listening will get from uh, the experience once the credits roll i think i think once they're done if you come back and say i want more i, I want more yeah. i want to see rider again i want to see pv again i want to see drag again if you feel that that's we did it we hit it because we've we've sown the seeds for the future. That's mm-hmm. important to me. Sown the seeds for the future. I very much like that. We have now a quick fire. Ten. You've, if you listen this far, we do appreciate it. We have ten questions from the uh, Mass Effect Reddit community. Of course, Michael, say no, can't answer that to any of them. It might be all of them. Uh, are you ready? You set up? 
Yeah, I'm ready. Okay, so number one from Maya San asking the question, and I think it's a pretty good one, will we have the option to change outfits of our uh, squad mates in any sort of way? Pass. Uh, Pass. All right. Well, this it's not a good start. Um, <laughs> um, are there any sort of numbers or estimates that have to do with uh, the main plot of finishing the story of hours played? Uh, the, the main plot is hey? longer than Mass Effect 3, but okay. pass otherwise. Okay. Pass otherwise, but longer than Mass Effect 3. I like that one. Um, one more second here. I guess that answers that question. You can't answer how long a completionist run would be, I imagine. No, but it's, it's simply massive. Like, it's just massive. Okay. Um, are there any, have you guys talked at all now about uh, DLC plans of anything like that? Can we expect an announcement, I guess, once the game comes out uh, about maybe what the plans would be from Bioware? Yeah, we have plans for supporting the game post-launch. We okay. have plans for different stories that we want to tell. Part of it, part of it's also dependent on, you know, what you guys say when the game comes out. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Um, I know it hasn't been announced yet. Are we going to have like a Javik Day One DLC sort of thing? No, there's okay. nothing. All right. No character DLC. Uh, pretty easy one. I don't actually know this. A rough estimate of how many weapons are in the game. Oh uh, God. That's a tough one. I don't know. I would answer this if I had the information, but I don't. So yeah. I don't want to answer wrong. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one more question. Oh, um, sorry. Just going through these quickly. Uh, will there be, in terms of enemies, areas that have higher level enemies, or do they scale with you? They scale. They okay. Scale. But, but you also have higher level enemies in certain areas as well. Are there amb- this is the connection with uh, Shia Masarna saying that incorrectly? Is there would there be kind of boss enemies on certain planets not tied um, to the story? Yeah, I don't want to call them boss, sure. but yeah, there's 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 definitely formidable enemies on each planet, big ones. Okay, and just two more. Uh, you've gotten the full nudity rating. Are there going to be naked dancers like we're so used to in the the previous games of either gender? That was the other. That was the important question about. There's male dancers too. That was something the person underlined. Ah, uh, yeah. You'll have to wait and see. Okay, that's mm-hmm. that's appealing. And finally, a question. I promise you, folks, he will not answer. Are there Quarian in Mass Effect Andromeda? I'm so not answering that question. <laughs> There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mike. I really appreciate it. Again, we are very, very close. Mass Effect Andromeda just around the corner. If this didn't get you excited, I don't know what else will. Uh, Keep watching. Zandy Burkowski for VGS. This is VGS with Andy and Dave on Talk Radio, AM 640. Just going to roll with it here. VGS, a big thank you again. Dave's on vacation. To Mike Gamble for taking part, as always. No, not as always. He's the first time he's here as a producer of uh, Mass Effect, telling us some juicy secrets. Mass Effect Andromeda. I'm really excited. Getting ready for Jal. He's the Thane 2.0. Eh, I don't oh, like, I don't like Thane. Geez, Richard, I don't do you even... ever get that nickname? Jal? Uh, no. Because of his hair? No, because his last name is Jellison. Jellison. Oh, I thought because of his ridiculous life choices. It's pomade, thanks. <laughs> okay. Richard Jellison's here. <laughs> Liam Brand, big thanks. If they want to check us out online, uh, Rich, where should they go? Go to Facebook. Facebook? Facebook. Facebook.com slash VGS640. Go to Twitter.com slash VGS underscore 640. Got it. You can go to SoundCloud.com slash video dash games dash right. sophistry. Right. YouTube.com slash video games sophistry. I think we're good. All yes, right. indeed. He plugged it sufficiently. He did. He did enough <laughs> plugs. We will say goodbye. Next week, it will be, again, heavy on Mass Effect. Our review, hopefully, of Mass Effect Andromeda. You've been waiting for it. Big thanks again, Mandy Burkowski from PGS.